Major funding for NJ Spotlight News is provided in part by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. New Jersey Realtors, the voice of real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com and by the PSCG Foundation. Tonight on NJ Spotlight News, a New Jersey pharmacist who had been trapped in Gaza is now safely home. She shares her heartbreaking journey as the Israel-Hamas conflict approaches its eighth month. Being in this kind of war zone, being able to be a humanitarian relief for others is something I believe is a must. Plus, self-administered birth control is now available over the counter without a prescription, but few pharmacists are certified. This is groundbreaking for women. And the more we can eliminate these barriers to contraception, the better our lives will be. Also, the state looks to crack down on e-bikes, looking to license and insure them. But advocates want to pump the brakes on the legislation. Let's call this bill what it is. It is an attack on biking, an attack on immigrants, an attack on street safety for all of us. And a new Rutgers study has some answers for those suffering from the most debilitating symptoms of long COVID, brain fog. I think the, the, the issue of long COVID is really a, a huge one, not only in New Jersey, but across the country. NJ Spotlight News begins right now. From NJ PBS Studios, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venozzi. Good evening and thanks for joining us this Wednesday night. I'm Brianna Venozzi. A New Jersey pharmacist and mother of six who was stranded at a hospital in Gaza is back home with her family tonight. Gada Abu Kweik of Totowa was part of a group of 19 medical workers volunteering at the European hospital just outside of Rafah since May 1st. But one week into their mission, escalations by the Israeli military caused the borders to be sealed, trapping Abu Kweik and the other volunteers, which included Americans and a New Jersey doctor NJ Spotlight News spoke with before the team was evacuated with the help of the White House. But the group said they left the region with deep reservations, heartbroken to abandon their Gazan patients and others who weren't being guaranteed safe passage. Gada Abu Kweik is with me now to talk about her experience. Gada, you just returned home on Monday. How are you? Where is your mind at right now? Uh, I, I feel that I still live in Gaza with the real people and the real life over there. Um, um, I told my family and my kids, I'm not sure how long it's gonna take me to have the balance and uh, to go back to the real to, to the life in US. Um, it was the best ever three weeks that I had in my life in Gaza. The best ever. Why are you qualifying it like that? When, when, you, when you are helping people, and you are living with with people that they have nothing in life. They have no food, they have no water, they have no shelter, they have nothing. There is bombing all the time. Uh, and they're still happy and they still they still want to live. The injuries that we saw, even the doctors who were in different kind of zone, war zone in different countries before Gaza, they mentioned they never saw what they did in Gaza. It's totally, it, it, there is destruction in the infrastructure and the injuries that coming to the hospital, they are, most of them, they are coming dead, by the way. And when you see the, the body, uh, when you see the hands and the legs and the head by itself coming, you know, to the hospital, we heard about that. But when you see it in, in your eyes, it's totally different. And yet, somehow, you managed to provide a sense of safety to the people you were treating. What was it like inside the hospital? Uh, the, the health system is collapsing. The capacity of the people working in the hospital is less, less than 20%. However, the international medical team, 
they they are available in the hospital they provide the hope they provide the medications and the surgical supplies and the knowledge that they have with them when they come in so the safety that we have people just to see the vest that we are international medical medical doctors they feel that they are safe that this is a green zone they will not be killed in the hospital which they have the same experience before in shifa hospital back a few months ago that's number one number two the the w w medical missions usually get with them so many supplies and medication surgical supplies and equipment so those kind of things we use it while we are there for the two weeks um, so we have all these kind of plenty things that we are able to help doctors. The doctors over there, they are, as I mentioned, less than 30 or 20 percent of the capacity of the hospital. Either they are killed or they are relocating their families. So being around them, someone who come for only two or three weeks. So we have all the energy, the energy to help them out. Doctors over there, they are exhausted. They are working full time. Of course, they are all volunteers. They are not been paid for how many hours not be, not able to see their families for eight months so just imagine how they feel and how and how we are able to help them with that i, I can't I, and many of us can't and so it, it begs me to ask would you go back again if the opportunity were to present itself given what you've seen and, and what you know now i told them i will be the first to go i promised people over there that i will not leave them and i will come once they open the borders, we know the story about what happened with us. We should be there only for two weeks. But what happened that when the Israeli uh, um, blocked the borders, Rafah borders, we were not able to come back. And the other mission, which is in Cairo, not been able also to go across to go to Gaza. Being in this kind of war zone, being able to be a humanitarian relief for others is something I believe is a must. And I urge all doctors, surgeons, pharmacists, nurses, nurses to write their name and to be and to go with the medical missions to Gaza. I can't imagine those conversations, Kata, with your family, with your young ones, especially. I'm sure that had to be very painful for you as a mom and scary for them, knowing that you may not return. Uh, my family, my brothers and sisters, they didn't talk to me and they told me, you cannot go there. You have no mind to go over there. You are a woman. You have kids. They need you more than people over there. You are a pharmacist. You, you, what are you going to do? And they were against me being there. My family, I mean, my husband and my kids, they actually didn't want me to go. And my little one, six years old, didn't talk to me a word while I was in Gaza. I believe because he was worried about me. And his his colleagues uh, in, in the school, they told him, his peers, that your mom going to die. No one goes there and will come back life. Um, but my kids, they work with me in COVID time. And CureMed was number two pharmacy in the United States with uh, E through North and Mikasin. We did the most vaccinations and testing in, uh, in New Jersey. So we ranked number two pharmacy. So they knew what does it mean to help people. My kids, they have shelter, they have house, they have food, they have everything. Over there, they have nothing. You, you cannot imagine, it's it's a city of ghosts. We, we see how the horrors movies are. Over there is more than that. And still people, they they say, we want to live. We. We, we, are, we are sure that, you know, one day going to come very soon and we will have, we will be back to our homes. We will build it up and things will be different. A city of ghosts. Um, the example that you're setting for your family is remarkable. Uh, and as are you. Gara, thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Meanwhile, the student-led protests against the Israel-Hamas war have mostly come to a halt. But without an agreement from New Jersey University officials to divest and boycott Israel, as demonstrators demanded. At Rutgers Newark, the administration this week told organizers of a pro-Palestinian encampment it's time to leave. After three weeks of sleeping in tents to make their stance known, and as Rutgers President Jonathan Holloway is set to testify before Congress about reports of anti-Semitism, on campus. But as Melissa Rose Cooper reports, student protesters say they're not going anywhere.
What's hard, at least personally for me, and I, I want to make sure that I'm very clear about that, like this is a personal statement for me, is that, you know, genocide is being happened. And people are like, oh, you're ruining my graduation, you're ruining my picnic. Kids are dying. And one of the things I often talk about is like, what's your line in the sand? I'm always going to do whatever in my power to make sure that I'm fighting for social justice issues. Anthony Diaz of the Newark Solidarity Coalition and Newark Water Coalition reacting to a recent request from Rutgers Newark to clear this encampment in support of Palestine just days before students at its law school are set to graduate. I get it. You know, you work three years. This is the culmination of like the peak, you know, highlight of your life or career or professionalism. And then you, you come and you see this Palestinian encampment. But I think what we have to realize as Americans is that we don't live in a bubble. All of these interconnecting points, the intersectionality of the struggle, the land back for the Palestinians, the land back for the Newarkers, it's all tied up in one another. So people need to constantly be reinforced in that. Now on its 22nd day, participants of the encampment have been calling on the university to divest from Israel and reinvest resources into Newark's communities and their needs, like more affordable housing. I've always felt like personally connected to the Palestinian issue, especially as a Kashmiri person, uh, and even as someone who lives in Newark at the moment, all of these struggles are interconnected, so it felt important to speak out, especially with what's been going on. It's a genocide ongoing across the ocean that is an extension of the genocides that have been committed here um, and all over the world by imperialist and colonial powers that have been doing this for hundreds of years now and it needs to stop. The cycles of violence need to stop. But despite two negotiation meetings with the school administration, students say their demands are still not being met. They are putting a lot of the research and the finding of the resources on us, um, which they're an institution in this city with billions of dollars and academics and people that it's their profession to research this kind of stuff and figure out how it works. But instead of them asking people to do that, they are telling us that we need to come with them with these fully formed plans on how exactly to do this. And that just doesn't seem like you're acting in good faith. If you have all of these resources and you're available to do this type of resource and you really want to work with us to accomplish these things that we're asking, then you would put people on it. A spokesperson from Rutgers Newark maintains they reached out to students in good faith at the start of their protest to address their concerns. The spokesperson also says they reached out to students again yesterday and are waiting for them to respond. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Melissa Rose Cooper. Well, as of this week, pharmacies in New Jersey are now allowed to sell hormonal birth control without a prescription, making the state one of roughly 30 in the country where you can get the contraception over the counter. The new rules are based on a law Governor Murphy signed in 2023, allowing pharmacists to dispense birth control pills, patches and diaphragms, among others. But a senior correspondent, Brenda Flanagan, reports don't expect to find a participating pharmacy right away. Those who opt in will We'll have a few hoops to jump through first. Need birth control? You've got a lot more options now in New Jersey where drugstores can offer you contraceptive pills, rings, patches, and injectables. No prescription needed and no visit required to see a doctor first. But there is a safety check. We need to make sure that, that people are not just blindly taking these kind of medications without, because there are risk factors involved. Yes, Shah of Hudson Drug says first-time clients will get questioned by specially trained pharmacists who will do mandatory health screening looking for possible risks. If they have any risk of cancer, if they're taking any medications that may interfere with these types of medications, for example, if they're currently uh, taking an antibiotic, antibiotics can do decrease the effectiveness of birth control pills. So we will tell them to use maybe a secondary form of, of contraception. I'm really excited that people won't have to wait for appointments, like potentially delaying their ability to access care by being able to go to their local pharmacy, talk to their pharmacist, get screened there, and be able to get the medication right then and there. Dr. Kristen Brandy says patients have been able to buy the FDA-approved O-pill over-the-counter since March, but that birth control method uses progesterone only. Now New Jersey's joining more than 20 other states offering pills that also include estrogen, plus other self-administered options. The CDC says almost half of U.S. pregnancies are unintended. That motivated Senator Shirley Turner to sponsor this bill. By the time 
you get an appointment with a doctor, they could be pregnant or pregnant again with another child. So this is groundbreaking for women. And the more we can eliminate these barriers to contraception, the better our lives will be. The State Division of Consumer Affairs is working on a website that will list pharmacies that offer self-administered birth control without a prescription, but it's gonna take some time to get the pharmacists trained and ready. CVS supports the law. Walgreens says it's looking into it. Meanwhile, birth control suddenly headlined presidential campaign news when former President Donald Trump told CBS affiliate KDKA in Pennsylvania that, like abortion, it should be up to the states. You know, things really do uh, have a lot to do with the states, and some states are going to have different policies than others. But I'm coming out within a week or so uh, with a very comprehensive policy. Trump reversed himself after the comment provoked a furious backlash, saying he'd never restrict birth control and blamed, quote, a Democrat fabricated lie. But it reverberated in New Jersey, a so-called sanctuary state for reproductive rights in a post-Dobbs landscape. It's a great threat to women. And I think that has been demonstrated in many states when they have put the issue on the ballot. Right now we have great laws, but there's always a chance of something like a federal ban that could prevent our care in our state. New Jersey's no prescription birth control law doesn't have an age restriction. Available products won't include diaphragms since those need to be fitted at a clinic. Products will become more available as more pharmacists take the four hour online training course. For now, advocates advise Jersey residents to call ahead before going to their local pharmacy. In Creskill, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. Support for the Medical Report is provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. In our Spotlight on Business report tonight, a potential roadblock for e-bike owners. A proposed bill moving through Trenton would require electric bikes and scooters to be registered with the state MVC and insured, just like cars. Because while pedestrians and traditional bicycles are covered by no-fault insurance, low-speed e-bikes are not. As senior correspondent Joanna Gagas reports, the legislation is getting major pushback from those who say it would create barriers for low-income residents and others who argue the insurance just doesn't exist. Let's call this bill what it is. It is an attack on biking, an attack on immigrants, an attack on street safety for all of us. A group of more than 40 organizations came together today to protest a bill, S-2292, that creates strict regulations for e-bikes in the state. Each year, motor vehicle crashes kill over 600 New Jerseyans and over 1,000 New Yorkers. And a growing proportion of those casualties are e-bike and scooter riders themselves. Meanwhile, there have been so few e-bike versus pedestrian crashes that we don't even track them. So why are our legislators seeking to punish the likely victims of fatal crashes? The bill, sponsored by Senate President Nick Scatari and Senator Vin Gopal, would require low-speed electric bikes and scooters to be registered with the Motor Vehicle Commission. It would ban the use of any unregistered e-bikes and scooters, and it would require owners to have insurance coverage. Adding on an extra layer of cost just to insure this level one e-bike would really be a burden and it would cut out not just people who do e-bag delivery, but anybody who, for whatever reason, cannot afford a car. The coalition, made up of bike and pedestrian advocates, clean energy groups, and members of the insurance industry, sent a letter of opposition to Skatari and Gopal today, highlighting what they say is the plan's ineffectiveness and inconsistencies in the state's net zero goals. Skatari's office offered no comment on the bill at this time. Senator Gopal told us he expects the bill to be amended based on these concerns, and the insurance industry says the bill right now mandates something they they can't deliver. Enacting a mandate on the tens of thousands of these devices that are already in place, we don't have the insurance capacity to, to meet that. It's going to take time, and, and that's one of our major concerns with this legislation is the time's not really built in uh, to the legislation as proposed for us to do this right. And they warn it could have unintended consequences. This proposed legislation by requiring insurance and registration could potentially lead to more unwarranted police stops, disproportionately targeting BIPOC riders. 
Moreover, out-of-state bicyclists may face penalties, particularly in resort communities in the, on the Jersey Shore, where many visitors bring their e-bikes on vacation. This could deter tourism and negatively impact local economies. A better solution, these groups say, create a Vision Zero policy across the state. The Vision Zero Alliance has drafted an alternative bill that would create what they call the Vision Zero Commission. So let's go where the danger is. Look at statewide where a crash is happening, why are they happening there every year, and what is the state doing to improve safety there. Jersey City has a great Vision Zero policy. They eliminated fatal crashes on local streets uh, recently, and neighboring Hoboken has gone seven years without a fatal crash. Um, and because of that success, you know, Secretary Pete Buttigieg called out Hoboken at the national level and said it's an example. And every county in New Jersey is working on a Vision Zero policy right now. But they don't have jurisdiction over state roads where a lot of fatal crashes happen in New Jersey. They say fix the roads and you'll need less insurance, but adding more insurance will do nothing to improve safety. In Jersey City, I'm Joanna Gagas, NJ Spotlight News. Turning to Wall Street, stocks slipped from record highs today. Here's where the markets closed. Support for the Business Report is provided by Riverview Jazz, presenting the 11th annual Jersey City Jazz Festival, May 29th to June 2nd. Event details, including performance schedules and location, are online at jerseycityjazzfestival.com. tonight, four years after the global COVID-19 outbreak was declared a pandemic, millions of people are still suffering from one of the virus's worst side effects, long COVID, and for some, the debilitating brain fog it causes. Researchers at Rutgers University recently published one of the most detailed investigations into the symptom, looking at how and why long COVID causes some people to experience difficulty thinking or concentrating. Dr. William Hu is the senior senior author of the study, and he joins me now to share what his team discovered. Dr. Hu, it's so good to have you on the show. I think there are a lot of people who are interested in this topic. What did the findings from your study show? Well, thank you for having me. I think the, the, the issue of long COVID is really a, a huge one, not only in New Jersey, but across the country. One of the biggest questions that, that people asked me a number of years ago was, what happened to people with long COVID? And we really didn't have a good understanding because the disease was so new. So we recruited a group of people who were coming here to Rutgers for care, and we followed them over time to see what happened to their memory issues, or what many people call brain fog over right. time. And over the course of two years, about half of the people experienced improvement in their cognition, whether the other half did not. So we were able to at least answer the question that, you know, there is some recovery, but the recovery is slow. We also try to understand what the basis for this recovery was. And so we recruited a subgroup of people to undergo spinal fluid collection and analysis. We did something that was fairly extraordinary that we were able to collect all the immune cells in the spinal fluid that were in contact with the brain. And we were able to study the genes in these cells. And what we learned was that uh, long COVID was really very similar to acute infection, acute SARS-CoV-2 infection. In the field, there's a lot of debate about whether this is due to a post-infectious autoimmune process, mm -hmm. whether this is a chronic infection, or sadly, whether this is all in the patient's heads. Correct me um, if I'm wrong, doctor, because there were thoughts, at least early on in the pandemic, that perhaps the long COVID, the brain fog that you're speaking about, maybe shared some similarities with um, what we would find in dementia or, or Alzheimer's. But, but you're saying what you found contradicted that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we routinely see the people suffering from Alzheimer's disease or living with Alzheimer's disease. So we have pretty precise markers and we did not find Alzheimer's signatures in any way in, in, the, in the group of people with long COVID. Um, so we 
fairly convincingly excluded Alzheimer's as a potential mechanism for the brain fog. So that's the good news. Um, did you find anything about what might be helpful in terms of speeding up the recovery for folks who have long COVID? Well, from a biological, biochemical perspective, what we found is that people who were able to mount a strong immune reaction to fight the infection, uh, they were better at clearing the, the uh, brain fog over time. Whereas if people fail to achieve this, and this is this is a, a biological pathway that's what's kind of directed downstream from a molecule called interferon. And if people were unable to mount this response, then their brain fog never quite improved. Wow. Dr. William Hu is the senior author of a study at Rutgers University looking into long COVID and brain fog specifically. Thank you so much for sharing your findings with us. Thank you for having me. That does it for us tonight, but don't forget to download the NJ Spotlight News podcast so you can listen anytime. I'm Brianna Venozzi for the entire NJ Spotlight News team. Thanks for being with us. Have a great evening. We'll see you back here tomorrow night. New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And New Jersey Realtors, the voice of real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com.